From being lost in the world and severely depressed, to doing hundreds of millions of dollars with multiple e-commerce brands that I started from nothing, to having multiple life-redefining spiritual interactions with death. My name is Robert Oliver, and this is my story. So my story isn't about money, but I wanna tell you the exact details of how I engineered this game that we call life to give me total and complete financial freedom. And perhaps most importantly, I have proof that God is alive and actually allows for us to get exactly where we wanna go. I've made multiple people in my circle millionaires. I've bought my dream beachfront mansion. My wife gets to drive whatever car she wants. I get to spend time raising my two daughters and I'm building generational wealth in this process. So I grew up in the Washington state on the border of two cities. Tacoma and Federal Way. Tacoma was recently identified as one of the most dangerous cities in America, but look, I had good parents. They actually kept me in private Christian school until high school. I was the stereotypical ADD f off that most people wrote off as dumb. I would have stayed longer, but I got expelled. You see, I have this incredible skill where I can hear a song just once or twice and know every word. Turns out in private school, most girls don't want Eminem lyrics sung to them. Hi kids, do you like Primus? Yeah, Wanna yeah, see me yeah. stick nine inch nails to each one of my eyelids? <laughs> My dad was an entrepreneur. He was the true embodiment of the old school American dream. No college degree, started from absolutely nothing, and he made enough money to send his boys to private school. Watching my dad pick up and outwork everyone year over year, it really is a lot of where my foundation comes from. Like I said, he had no formal education, no advanced knowledge, he had nothing growing up, but he knew how to hustle and he knew how to close a deal. By just showing up every day and wanting it more than everyone else, he created a much better foundation for me than he ever would have dreamed possible for himself. So one of my first real business moments comes from going to the Sonic games when I was a young kid. I was probably like first grade at the time and a lot of the time we'd show up to the games without tickets because he loved to work with the scalpers. He liked to hustle the hustlers. And for me, there was always this like awkward energy, right? The scalpers are usually black. He's this little white dude. And he would just get in there and mix it up. He put himself in these like, like I felt super uncomfortable, but he would get them, you know, betting against each other. He said, hey, this guy would, this guy would do the tickets for 100, but this guy said he'd do it for 90. W will you beat 90? Yeah, I beat 90. Well, will you do 80? And he would just get them, you know, clanking. And they were friends, but he'd come in there and disrupt the whole mix. It was, you know, at the time, it was like very strange for me. But in hindsight, I'm like, oh, like this was a zero sum game. This is kind of how the world works. And, you know, hat off to that. Eventually, this transitioned into me wanting to hustle and make some money as well. And so I fell into the sneaker flipping business. This was early high school, and I was super into shoes. I used to collect them. And this was the first time where I realized, hey, I can make some money out of a passion of mine. Basically, I had a homie who worked at Foot Locker and I would always lean on him for the new releases. He would actually bring them to me a day before they actually were released in the stores. These were always sneaker drops that people would camp out for and there'd ultimately be like a dramatic, you know, uh, resale market. They'd sell for a lot more. We realized that Foot Locker actually had a pretty big allocation and so it was no big deal if 10 or 15 pairs were committed to friends and family. In this era, it actually predated drop shipping, but we'd collect the money up front from people that were in the market, and then we'd distribute the shoes after. I actually got a really good taste of how business could go wrong here. I remember this vividly. It was a Jordan 4 release. And you see, in this world of sneaker flipping, our customer base wasn't always the most reputable. And so there was one situation where, you know, one of our customers was a drug dealer, for sure, no doubt about it. And Foot Locker changed the allocations on us. So long story short, we had collected the money from him but we didn't have the actual shoes and obviously we're gonna go to him we're gonna make it right we're gonna give him his money back but this man wanted those shoes and he actually like he flashed a gun on us a young high school kid I'm just like oh shit like this is okay all right and it ended up being cool like we squashed it I think we got him first in line for the next release but again you know there's there's conflict in business from time to time so you know what else is funny I had this affinity for shoes and fashion but I still couldn't get any girls in high school. People see me now, 6'4 athlete, peak shape, and they don't believe me when I tell them that I was 5'3 my junior year of high school. I think this probably had some sort of amplified psychological effect on me that I still haven't processed yet, but bro, I got turned down by every single cute girl. And like, I remember my sophomore year, there was this girl I was crazy about. And I wrote her this you know, little letter. It was like a love letter with some song lyrics. And I remember walking up and handing it to her. Like sophomore year, you know, nervous little kid. And I remember her watching, I remember watching her read it, laugh, and then show her friends. And the, the rest of that year, maybe the next two years, her friends would always like mockingly sing that song from time to time. 
A lot of that is ultimately what drove me to become who I wanted to be because it sent me down this intense path of self-development. It became personal with me. I started hitting the weights hard. F those bitches. We got no love for these hoes. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Sensational. I took that same energy into college and I felt like this is where I really started to come into my own. I hit the weights every day. I focused on myself and I feel like I really put the hours in. This is actually around the time that I started to formulate my own supplements in search of an upgraded physique. I was glowing up and some of that magic ultimately manifested during my 19th birthday. I took a trip up to Whistler, Canada with a handful of close friends and then invited another group of friends as well. And this other group of friends was this girl, Jing. And so on the night of my birthday, my main friend group got up to Whistler early. I'm going hard, this is college. I'm like 30 drinks in, and this was actually the first night that I dropped malt, first time in my life. By the time Jing and the other friend group get into town, I am truly in another world, but I remember seeing her and pretty much thinking like, this is the only thing I care about right now. I was actually with another girl at the time who I just immediately lost interest in. At some point in the night, my best friend actually helped shuttle the old girl away back to the house early because I wanted to stay and talk to Jing. Now, I don't know if this was the mall or my newfound charisma from the weights, but she says I was quite charming that night and didn't make a total idiot of myself. I don't remember it at all. Nothing more would really happen on this trip, but when we got back to campus, I immediately broke it off with the other girl. There's a little drama there, but it's all good. And uh, I asked Jing out on a date. Somehow she said yes. Now this is where the good part comes in. We did the normal date thing, you know, dinner, talking, it's all good. 7.30 rolls around. And I'm like, man, this goes way out of my league, but I gotta, I gotta shoot my shot. We're finishing up dinner. And I'm like, yo, you wanna like just go up to Canada and make it a memorable night? Like, let's, let's party. She looked shocked. The Canadian border is like two hours away, but everyone knows Vancouver is a good time. So, um, like I said, at the time she was shocked, but she later admitted that she loved the instinctive improvision. We drove two hours up to the border, grabbed a bottle of Patron, and we had the, the night of our lives, you know? The rest really was history. From there, I walked onto the basketball team and I, I made the most out of that college experience. In hindsight, these were some of the best moments of my life. And this was with like a hundred bucks in my bank account, you know? So there's a lesson somewhere in there. So anyways, I graduated and it was time to enter the real world. I actually graduated a semester early and now I had to figure out how to make money. I always knew I was gonna make money. I always knew I was gonna be an entrepreneur. But now it's like, okay, how am I gonna really make that happen? This was a time that I hit a down in my life. You know, I struggled. I started smoking weed. I ultimately ended up depressed. There was no clear cut path to millions. Now, eventually I saw my uncle helping brands sell their products on Amazon and he was making what appeared to be stupid money. And I remember thinking, I don't think my uncle's that smart. He's making a killing. So I decided that I need to look into this Amazon thing and maybe give it a go. I didn't think much of it at the time, but I would just call up supplement brands and I would help them get their products listed. And all of a sudden we'd be making sales. $20,000, $30,000 a month. I'd be getting commission. It was all good. After about six months, I realized that this was way bigger than I had originally thought, and it's time to start my own brand. I took the $5,000 I had in my savings and poured it into the development of the Genius brand. The idea was to create an all-natural sports nutrition business. I realized that most brands on the market didn't care about quality like I did, and so I set out on a mission to change the game. I was just a kid pursuing his passion project. Some will tell you that starting a business is risky, but to me, the real risk was always getting stuck in my hometown, living an ordinary life. To this day, few actually realize the true potential of Amazon FBA and harnessing Prime to create your own brand. Jeff Bezos gives you a platform where you can take an idea and turn it into generational wealth. That $5,000 would ultimately go on to make me $20,000 per day, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Pretty much right around the time Genius was launched into the market, I got the craziest call of my life. So I remember I was sitting there working when my mom called. It was a different tone, you know, where just something isn't right. I still remember that call pretty f***ing clearly. She said, your dad took your Nana in for an operation this morning and something went wrong. Her voice trailed off and she, uh, she broke out into tears. So my Nana, our grandma, who really was the center of our family, went in for a procedure on her leg. My dad was the one that took her in that morning. It was a four hour operation. The doctors had actually come out and told him that it was a great success. They were gonna close her up and she'd be out in 30 minutes. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't see them again for hours. So as it turns out, her heart stopped. They spent 56 minutes trying to revive her. And for those of you in the medical field, you know that this is like 50 minutes too long. So they brought her back, but there wasn't any brain activity. Our entire family spent that week in the ICU just hoping and praying for a miracle, you know? Uh, I love my Nana. 
some of my fondest childhood memories were with her. It was a surreal experience. She was barely 70. She had just gotten back from Africa. Like, that's where Christmas dinner was. She really was like a really young 70. I think the hardest thing for me was watching my dad lose her. Because throughout my childhood, my dad was generally unshakable. I think I saw him cry maybe once during my great grandma's funeral. That week, you got to see his mortality, but all of my emotions were amplified even further because you got to see a real accumulation of how he had built himself as a person. So many people came to the ICU for this dude. Old employees, old friends, people from church. People would come, they'd leave gifts. None of it felt real. Seeing him break brought me face to face with the worst reality possible. One day I'm gonna lose my parents too. We all are. He was living my nightmare. After a week in the ICU, I'll never forget that last day. It was actually Easter when my grandpa decided to pull the plug. He didn't want to be in the room and neither did my dad. They said their goodbyes and left the room as the nurse removed the oxygen. There were a couple of us in the room and we all held hands. My mom was to my left, Jing was to the right. They played one of her favorite songs, Elton John's Rocket Man. Hear it still, it's like, and I'm gonna be high. I, as a kite by then. She took a final gasp and, and that was it. You could feel her soul leave that room. When we finally left the hospital, I had a lot of soul searching to do. They say that things never normalize after a loss like that, you just find a new normal. And I believe that to be true. Eventually, I remember just finding a bit of closure in this idea that the thing my Nana was most proud of in this world was my father and the successes that he had, including raising his family and seeing that next generation take off. She saw that future in me. And so this is when I realized I wanted to make the most of my business career and the most out of this life. I felt like I had to take it to another level for what you know my father had accomplished. This is when I poured into the Genius brand. It became my obsession. I saw the original clip about Elon working like 100 hours a week and I said, I can do that, easy. And I did. I knew very little about anything business. I just kept figuring it out. I hired a couple of my closest friends and I gave them some equity. The growth was just exponential. We went to a million and then to five and then to 15. It was like a fucking rocket ship and I was damn near positive we were gonna go straight to 100. But again, the universe had different plans for me at this point. What I learned is that real entrepreneurship is rarely, if ever, a straight line. Your resolve will get tested and the most important thing is that you simply don't give up. In the middle of our meteoric rise, Amazon released a new AI bot program designed to punish anyone that thought they had fake reviews. So I've told this story a little bit before, so I'll give you an abbreviated version. The business is like at 15 million or something, somewhere around that range. And I leave the country for the first time. Me and my wife decide to get married in Ireland. So it's just direct family. We get married, the ceremony's beautiful. The business is still plugging along. I'm a little anxious to leave it. And all of a sudden that wedding night, I look at three of our products and they just start losing chunks of reviews. It's like 20 at a time every 30 minutes. This happened for the next several hours until the products ultimately had zero reviews. And if you know anything about Amazon, zero reviews is a death kiss. This same process repeated week after week for like the next eight weeks or something like that. All in all, we ended up losing about half of our business in the course of two months. So the business was cut in half. It was at this time I sat down with my best friends, because these aren't just employees to me, these are friends, these are brothers. And we had two choices. We could like liquidate the remaining inventory, put some cash in our pocket and walk away, or we can double down. Because it wasn't just us being hit, it was like everything on Amazon. So we took the remaining capital we had and we launched a handful of the best sellers that we have to date. This was the most aggressive moment in the business. We not only doubled down, we tripled down. Everyone said, fuck it, we're gonna go for this and we're gonna build and we're gonna create. The business, like, you know, we got back to that same point we were with all the new product launches. And then Amazon admitted they made a mistake and gave us all our reviews back. And so at this point, now the business is, you know, 30 million and we are booming. It's at this point that a private equity fund comes in, right around the time that you know I find out I'm expecting my first child, private equity firm comes in, they make us an offer that we just, we can't refuse. It was too good, I made a whole video on that, you should check it out later, I'll link it below. But we exit the business, multiple eight figures, and I am riding high. I'm living the good life for like a year. So my daughter's born, I'm still working for the business, but taking it kind of easy, it's all good. We're having a great year. I'm enjoying being a father. And then one day, kind of out of nowhere, my wife notices like this irregular mole growing behind my ear. She tells me that I need to go in and get this checked out. And me being me, I don't think too much of it. You know, I agree, but I don't really make any concrete plans. It isn't until later that summer where my mom tells me that you are taking my dermatology appointment. She had an appointment scheduled. 
She slid me in. I went in, still not thinking any big deal of this. The dermatologist looks at my ear and he tells me, that is coming off today and there's like a 50% chance. It's like 50% chance of what? I still don't really know what that means, right? And so he removes it entirely and says that it has to go off for a biopsy. The results can take like a week. Now the next two weeks were quite eventful. My wife and I had plans to go to Texas to look for new homes. We're planning on moving. So we fly out to Texas the next day and I get the wonderful and surprising news that she's pregnant again, daughter number two. The following day, we actually find a dream house as well that is off the market. You know, like this neighborhood we're looking in, you can't get anything. And so for us to be able to see this house in the first place, it was like a complete fluke deal. We put an offer in on the spot. 24 hours later, it's expected. And we're like, sweet, let's fucking go. New chapter, new $4 million house, loving it, right? I kid you not, within five minutes of the agent calling me to tell us that we got our offer accepted, I get another call from the dermatologist. Remember earlier how I said that my mom's voice on the phone just clearly let you know that something was up? So this guy starts the conversation with, are you sitting down? I'm like, I'm, I'm driving, but yeah, what's up? And he's like, well, your, your biopsy came back and pathology came back as melanoma. Now, I still really don't know what this means. I'm really pretty ignorant here. I'm like, okay, but, but what does that mean? He tells me, don't freak out. We got it way earlier than a lot of people do, but you need to go make an appointment with oncology and you need to go into the cancer center. They're gonna wanna do another wide excision surgery just to make sure that you have all the margins cleared. So I thanked him. I'm still, still not fully like understanding what's going on. And I told him that I'll make plans to do that ASAP. We'll get it done. And um, you know, we, we get back to the Airbnb we're staying at and I just go full research mode, full research mode. And I, I truly scare myself sick. For anyone that's ever had anything wrong, they say don't Google it. And this is why. Basically, melanoma is 100% curable if you get it on the surface, but once it gets into the body, it's one of the more aggressive cancers out there and actually one of the leading drivers of death in young people. Once the fear actually started to set in, I have a pretty aggressive coming to Jesus moment. Like literally, for the first time in probably four or five years, I opened the Bible app. The verse of the day is Isaiah 41.10. Do not fear, I am with you. Do not be anxious, I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. So this is the first Bible verse I see in like half a decade. Reassuring, still probably random, right? And then that same evening, same day, I'm trying to distract myself. And so I tune into Kanye's first listening party for his Donda album. It's quite the spectacle, but, but I'm enjoying it, you know? It's keeping me distracted, big Kanye fan. And I noticed that during one of the songs, he's flashing Bible verses on the mega screen and all throughout the stadium. And there it is again, Isaiah 41.10, same day. It's choked me up a little bit. Um, it was like, you know, minutes of with tuning into the performance, I'm seeing this Bible verse again. So I'm still hard on myself, but eventually I get that appointment on oncology. I think actually going into oncology was one of the worst things anyone can, can see. You get a firsthand view of uh, a reality that exists for so many. You see so many people with their lives clearly hijacked by this horrible malignancy. You know, still, none of this is something that I like talking about. It all fucked me up pretty good, but on that day, I'm heading to surgery. I then get a random text from my mentor's wife. She's a very strong believer, and she said that she was praying for me a lot. And guess what? At the end of that text, she throws in Isaiah 41.10. So when something occurs three times, it transcends mere coincidence. It reveals a pattern intricately woven by the hand of fate, by the hand of God. So much stuff kept happening throughout that whole trip. Like we were selling a property in Washington that we couldn't move a year prior within a day of listing it. Um, in the middle of all this craziness, we find out there was a bidding war. We get $300,000 over ask. It just felt like God saying, shut up. I got you. Just shut up. Just shut up. I got you. The doctor actually got me taken care of that day. Huge wide excision surgery. They take out a bunch of extra skin just to be straight. You know, I'll keep it real with you guys. This, this really did fuck me up for a while. There's this constant fear of recurrence. You have to follow up every three months. You go in, you meet the doctor again. So th this ultrasound too, this was like eight or nine months after the original surgery. And guys, it hit me again. That morning, I'm freaked the fuck out. I think for sure I got a swollen lymph node. I think, you know, it's recurrent. So I'm gonna have to get on immunotherapy. And I open my phone and Isaiah 4110. You know, I think they'd like wait at least a year to recycle the same verses, but for whatever reason, I, and I've checked my Bible app damn near every day. And the day I'm supposed to go in for this ultrasound, Isaiah 4110, do not fear, I am with you. And so right then I knew I was clear. I knew I was clear, but I went in and I get the ultrasound and they're not actually supposed to tell you that day, but the, the lady was feeling for me. She went over that spot and she goes, this is a cyst. There is no you know, blood flow here, you're good. I broke down crying right there. 
I broke down crying right there. And a week, two weeks after that, my second daughter was born. We did a natural birth and, you know, I created the playlist. I had a, I had a lot of Donda on there. And this whole time I'm weighing this world where you might not get to see your children grow up. Like, I think that's what's weighing on me the most. And when my second daughter was born, I fucking lost it. And, and my wife lost it. And right as she was being born, a Kanye song's on, Come to Life. And I had the live version, you know, the performance he did with, with Drake. And he just, he breaks out into a prayer. God, you know, if you can hear me tonight, put a firewall around all the families. Put a firewall around all the families. And it was like it, at that little moment that my daughter was born. And, you know, my wife looks at me and she's like, we did it. And I just, I, I start crying a lot. You know, I started crying a lot and she knew, she knew I was crying a lot. And she goes, you're gonna live a long life. You're gonna live a long life. You're gonna see your girls grow up. And it's gonna be fantastic. And so, so we leave that night, two girls now, a clear bill of health, the constant reminder that could all be taken away at any moment. And uh, I think most importantly, another opportunity to really make a mark. It was at that point that I truly realized there is no top of the mountain. There is no destination. We aren't going anywhere. Very few things actually matter in this life, but the human experience, it's just that. It's an experience. It's made to be experienced. I know in my heart that we are designed to experience it to the maximum. We are designed to create. We are designed to build. We are designed to leave things that transcend death. The point is to get to a place where you actually own your time and can pursue projects and build whatever it is you want to build. The point is to not answer to anyone other than God. With this energy, we took our new family unit back to Puerto Rico. This is where I decided I just wanna live every second of it. I wanna maximize my reach. I wanna maximize my network. It was around this time that I doubled down on personal brand. I launched my mentorship and you know, a little boutique private equity arm within Million Dollar Brand Club. The whole idea is that we're helping entrepreneurs get their ideas off the ground and give them a playbook to actually scale. We're taking pieces of the business and helping them prepare for exits. E-commerce changed my life. It opened so many doors, and I believe many brands will stand the test of time. I'm excited about what this next decade holds for myself, and I'm equally excited about what this next decade holds for you. If I can leave you with just one piece of advice from this entire video, it's just don't give a fuck. God's got you when you let him. <laughs>